Out of context, facts and figures can easily mislead. Is Africa's growing population a weakness? What about tomorrow? Don't get boxed in by today's opinions. With the Africa Report, understand Africa's tomorrow today. Politics, business, opinion, the Africa Report decodes the news for you. Available online on theafricareport.com. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yvonne Mohango. I'm the Sub-Saharan Africa Economist at Renaissance Capital. I welcome you to um, the um, 25th anniversary EM and FM conference that Renaissance Capital is hosting this week. I'll be giving you a macro update on the Sub-Saharan African region this afternoon. Um, I hope you can see my presentation. I'll be speaking to the recovery and the signs that we're seeing. Um, as you heard from our speakers yesterday, Charlie Robertson and Dan Salter, um, they think there's upside for the emerging markets given the Biden win we've seen in the US. And I guess also recent news of a, a vaccine being in sight also implies that there is upside to our recovery. Um, however, when we draw down into Sub-Saharan Africa, I think the pace of that recovery when it comes uh, to a country level will be determined um, by fundamentals in that region. And I speak to a few of those uh, fundamentals in this particular slide. In brief, we expect the countries that will show a swifter recovery to have sizable agriculture sectors, um, low exposure to tourism, fiscal buffers, as well as household buffers. In terms of our view of the short-term risks that we see going forward, that includes uh, political uh, and election-related risks, um, the one that's probably most current is in Ethiopia. Um, I'm going into next year of elections, that will probably be um, Zambia, uh, particularly in terms of what it means for the fiscal outlook. And, uh, the the uh, second uh, risk I outlined there is around debt sustainability, uh, which also has implications for access to external financing. If we move along to Nigeria, and if we look at it based on the metrics that I've mentioned, um, I think the biggest weakness, in, in my view, for Nigeria is its absence of household buffers. Um, and that uh, explains why we think there'll be a protracted recovery for Nigeria. In terms of most recent um, GDP numbers coming out of um, Nigeria, we saw in the second quarter that the economy contracted by around 6%, and that the decline there was broad-based. So basically, the decline you saw in the non-oil sector was equivalent to that 
in the oil sector. Um, uh, and uh, that's, of course, reflecting the falling production that we've seen this year. Um, but I want to uh, bring you uh, and or highlight um, what consumption has meant for Nigeria. And this, once again, speaks to the absence of fiscal, uh, sorry, household buffers. Um, what we see in the second quarter numbers is that consumption collapsed. And we tell that from the uh, wholesale and retail um, sector growth number, wholesale and retail uh, trade is the second biggest economic sector in uh, Nigeria, and it is a proxy for the consumer, um, in our view. And as you can see um, on, on the graph in page uh, figure two, that the sector contracted by around 17% in the second quarter. And that corresponds with the fall in the consumer confidence index, um, which fell to a low that we last saw in 2016, around the time when we saw that sharp devaluation of the Naira. Um, so what you're seeing here is the consumer that was already struggling pre-COVID uh, pandemic. So the sector had been contracting for the four quarters preceding the second quarter, and that contraction simply dip, deepened in the second quarter this year. So um, given that the consumer was already challenged and has been hit even harder this year, that implies to us that the recovery in Nigeria should be a lot slower um, given the absence of buffers. If we just look at some of the other metrics, I'll speak to production, as I mentioned when I was showing you the GDP growth numbers, um, that there was a contraction in that sector, and you can see why production did fall, in part due to the OPEC arrangement um, um, agreement to cut production, so that has implications uh, for the sector. In terms of our house view, uh, we expect production to fall by around 10% uh, this year, uh, compared to last year, and that will reflect in the GDP number. Next year, production, uh, in terms of our house, we expect production to be flat at around 1.8 million barrels per day, which implies limited upside for GDP in particular. For the current accounts or particular exports to improve, it implies your price would have to pick up because production would be flat. If we take a look at the current accounts for Nigeria for this year, what we did see um, at least up into the second quarter, is that the current account deficit did, did narrow. Our estimate is that it narrowed around 3.1% uh, of GDP from 4.6% a year earlier. And that was mainly due to a sharp fall in income um, outflows. So these are payments of dividends and interest income um, to those outside the country, as well as a fall in services receipts. So basically, Nigerians were paying less for services procured from foreign service providers. That helped mitigate the deterioration in the trade balance uh, that was due, of course, to fall in all exports. Um, so that did help in terms of containing the current account deficit in 2020, which moves us into the currency. And um, one thing to point out that's been interesting in terms of our observation is that contrary to the previous crisis when we saw the oil price fall, um, and that was around from 2015 onwards. Uh, this time around, we see that the overvaluation of, or the Naira hasn't become increasingly overvalued as we saw in 2015-16. Um, it's only become slightly, at this stage, slightly um, uh, misaligned compared to the start of the crisis, which leads us to believe that this could be as strong as the Naira gets this year. Uh, that's, of course, the less fundamental to deteriorate. Um, if we look at the, the overvaluation, our estimate at this stage, or at least on my real effective exchange rate model, is that the Naira is around 10% overvalued. So for fair value, it's sitting at around 420 Naira to the dollar. If we look at inflation uh, on monetary policy in the case of Nigeria, we have seen inflation pick up. Um, and the uh, floods that were reported um, earlier this year, this one, uh, media suggests that we have seen some um, the rice farmland or rice crops being washed away, which implies further upward pressure on uh, food prices. So we've seen inflation tick up. Um, for September, it, it increased around 13.7%. That's compared to around 11% a year earlier. We do think it will reach the mid-teens by year-end, and we expect inflation to remain in the teens going into 20. Um, 21. With regards to um, the monetary policy stance, we did see the central bank cut uh, the policy rate by a percentage point in May, and the surprise us with another percentage point in September. 
um, so we're sitting at around 11.5%. Uh, we expect no change to policy rate over the short term, uh, in part because inflation um, is on the rise, and also because we expect uh, the currency to continue to come under depreciation pressure. Lastly, uh, Nigeria, um, as you are all probably aware, the weakness in the fiscal finances is revenue, which is abnormally low. Pre-crisis, it was around 6% of GDP as compared to, say, 18% in Kenya. Um, and that, of course, has been halved given the fall in all export revenue. Um, if we look at the data for um, uh, fiscal performance in this current fiscal year, in the first half of the fiscal year, revenue did come in at around 43% below target which of course implied that there had to be expenditure cuts in about one-fifth. And unfortunately, CapEx was the casualty of those uh, expenditure cuts. The president has proposed an increase in the budget for next year of around 20% to 13.1 trillion naira, uh, which will be um, funded by an increase in revenue is what the government's projecting. We do see upside in all revenue, uh, in part because the price that was used for this particular year's budget was conservative. Uh, however, we do think they may struggle in terms of meeting their non-all revenue targets, given how weak growth is. Um, on the financing side, um, as you saw from the previous chart, treasury yields remain uh, pretty low, low single digits. And I guess that helps them in terms of financing using local debt because it keeps debt servicing costs relatively low. Moving on to Kenya. Uh, Kenya is one of the countries that we think um, will see a swifter recovery simply because it has a sizable agriculture sector, and in this particular year, there have been good rains. So if we look at the performance of the economy, um, most recently, uh, we had second quarter growth numbers, which were 5.7% decline. While that decline was sharper than expected, um, what was notable was that agriculture um, did grow rather strongly, um, and we expect that sector to contribute uh, to the economy actually showing some growth in this particular year. If I move on to this slide, I show you the contribution of the various sectors to um, Kenya's GDP growth. And you can see agriculture is right up there, uh, being the biggest contributor, contributed around 1.5 percentage points um, to uh, Kenya's GDP growth. Um, but of course, given the declines, uh, most notably in the hospitality sector, at the bottom of the chart, education, which was bigger than we'd anticipated, that of course offset that uh, contribution from agriculture. However, in the remainder of the year, as the other sectors begin to show some recovery, and that being due to a lifting of restrictions, a resumption of international flights, uh, we do expect agriculture's contribution to uh, be more impactful and allow the economy um, to grow in 2020. Um, tourism, just highlighting how hard that sector has been hit. Um, it was it showed the sharpest decline in the second quarter of around 83% a year on year decline compared to growth of 12% a year earlier. And that corresponds with that 99% decline in um, tourist arrivals in the second quarter. However, what's encouraging is that data from, as, uh, from July uh, going to August did start showing month and month pickup in um, tourist arrival numbers. And I guess that reflects um, your sorry, that reflects the pickup in um, um, all the flights uh, resuming. Sorry, just going back to the slides that I was on. Okay, I'm going to move along um, to Kenya. Um, looking at the PMI here, that's suggesting that the economy had a V-shaped uh, recovery. Um, uh, this year, it's actually, actually been a, a really strong improvement in the PMI, um, uh, which a record high actually uh, from the period uh, since uh, the PMI started for Kenya, which is early 2014. Um, so that in itself suggests that the recovery that came through in the second half of the year has been uh, pretty strong. Um, we've seen uh, occupancy numbers on these hotels uh, resuming operations, occup uh, occupancy numbers in hotels improving. The resumption of flights, particularly Kenya Airways, starting um, their flights again in August. International flights, that is, also resulted in a pickup in tourist arrivals, as I mentioned. Uh, the lifting of the ban in movements um, between Kenya's major cities also contributed to a pickup in transport and trade activity. Um, and as I mentioned to start, we expect agriculture's momentum uh, to continue in the second half of the year. 
um, move along to inflation. Um, Kenya has actually had one of the, the more benign um, inflation um, numbers this year. It's remained in the low to mid of single digits. Uh, did pick up in October to around 4.8%, but compared to peers, it's been relatively low and hasn't been as impacted by supply constraints as we've seen in other parts um, of the continent. This has allowed for monetary policy uh, to remain accommodative in that period. And we do expect the uh, central bank rate to be kept at 7% at this month's uh, NPC meeting and to remain um, uh, flat over the short term. If we move on to currency, uh, this is the shilling. Now, the shilling, as you've observed, has come under pressure this year. Uh, we've, we've been mentioning to you for a few years now that the currency is overvalued according to our, um, our estimates on our rate affected exchange rate model. Um, the shilling is around 20% overvalued on my model. Um, however, this year we have seen it appreciate in nominal terms, uh, reducing um, slightly that um, misalignment and um, just showing you that reserves, uh, which are FX reserves number, showing you that fall in reserves that has contributed to that pressure on the currency. And that, of course, reflects the fall in um, um, services uh, receipts to um, a large extent. If I move on to the rest of uh, the region, I'll start off here with Ghana, just speaking once again um, to the recovery. Um, second quarter numbers uh, showed an unexpected soft landing. We expected a um, sharper um, decline in that period. The Bloomberg consensus was for a 3.8% decline in the second quarter, that's year on year, and uh, came at 3.2%. Um, and if we look at the performance by sectors, we noted that uh, most sectors actually did grow uh, in Ghana in the second quarter. Um, only a handful declined, and that included hospitality, uh, trade, manufacturing, and the ex uh, extractive industry. Um, so we are still expecting growth this year out of Kenya. Uh, our project is around 2%. Sorry, out of Ghana, we're expecting growth around 2% and a pickup to around 4.3%. Of course, the downside risk are the elections that are due on the 7th of December. Um, and that could imply some stalling uh, of the recovery, at least for the fourth quarter. If we'll move on to Rwanda. Rwanda may be the exception in East Africa for us in terms of countries that do well uh, based on a sizable agriculture sector. And part of the reason for that is because of the stringent lockdown had. Um, I think the only other country that was comparable in terms of uh, um, um, the harshness of lockdown in the, sec in the second quarter was uh, South Africa. And both countries uh, had a double-digit declines in the second quarter of the year. Um, so only a handful of sectors uh, grew in uh, Rwanda's case. As you can imagine, the hospitality industry was hard hit. And this is a country, as you know, that's promoted itself for business um, tourism, business conferences. Um, it is encouraging, though, to hear uh, from the IMF that had a mission a virtual mission uh, visit to Rwanda last uh, month, uh, that it's um, seeing uh, encouraging signs of a pickup in economic activity. Um, however, we do think Rwanda will be an exception in East Africa and that it's likely to record a slight decline in growth for 2020, um, as opposed to the other economies which we expect to show um, some growth in East Africa. If we look at Zambia, um, Zambia, as you know, has dominated. Um, um, the media this year, and that's due to the um, um, the debt crisis and its um, sovereign debt default. Um, I just want to highlight, though, that its economic downturn preceded the uh, COVID crisis. Uh, you can see there from uh, um, around third quarter 2019 that growth uh, did begin to slow. The economy actually uh, contracted in the first quarter of the year, and that contraction deepened in the second quarter of the year. Um, and this contraction was largely due to the declines, double-digit declines in the wholesale and retail trade sector, construction, as well as the hospitality industry. Um, and the, um, the country's PMI suggests that a downturn bottomed in May. Um, however, the PMI remains below um, 50, uh, and below 50, as you know, implies uh, a decline. Um, so it does suggest that the contraction continued into the third quarter um, and the downside risk going forward would be a uh, poor rainfall because uh, that would have implications for the agriculture sector um, as well as um, subdue um, the recovery uh, in government revenue. So the outlook 
uh, does look pretty dire for um, in terms of growth for Zambia, um, given, of course, its fiscal situation and the fact that um, it was already in decline pre-COVID. If we look at inflation and um, interest rates across uh, some of the uh, smaller sub-Saharan African countries that we look at, um, what we have noted is that um, um, inflation did pick up in places such as Ghana, um, as well as uh, Zambia, and that was mainly due to supply disruptions, which was mainly noted or experienced in the transportation um, sector. Um, despite that pickup, we have had um, um, uh, monetary policy become accommodative um, in all markets. Uh, interest rates have been cut across the board, including in Ghana and in Zambia, resulting in negative uh, real policy rates. And that um, indicates that the government's focus has been to stimulate growth uh, despite the inflationary pressures in those economies. Our last slide is on FX. And I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, we like the East African currency. So outside of Kenya, we do find that the Rwandan franc, Tanzanian shilling, Ugandan shilling trade close to their fair values, which implies limited volatility and that they're relatively um, more stable. So those are the con uh, currencies um, that we do like. Uh, we are reviewing, as you can see from the chart, our Kenya forecast, given the depreciation pressures that uh, turned out to be stronger than we had anticipated. Um, and in terms of Nigeria, as we've mentioned, no bad currency that we expect to c continue to come under, uh, under depreciation pressures as we go into 2021. And to conclude, just want to highlight that in terms of the outlook, um, yes, we do expect 2021 to be a year of growth uh, generally across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, given the low base that we're coming from. And it does help, help that the global investment climate is likely to improve on the back on the, of the Biden uh, presidency and also talk of a vaccine being uh, uh, something that's in reach. Um, however, we think the countries that will do relatively better in Sub-Saharan Africa are those uh, with sizable agriculture sectors. Uh, low exposure to tourism, um, um, sizable fiscal and household buffers. And uh, the countries that stand out for us are those in East Africa. Uh, so Kenya definitely benefits from that, and Tanzania uh, certainly so, particularly given its fiscal buffers and now its elections are behind it. It does imply stability should be restored and growth return. Um, the countries we are concerned about, however, are countries like Nigeria, uh, which have a way I've mentioned where the consumer is hard hit and the recovery there is likely to be protracted, fiscal buffers are uh, limited, um, and the currency will continue to come under pressure to, to uh, depreciate there. Um, Ghana is also of concern uh, to us, um, uh, regardless of who wins the elections next month, uh, we are concerned about um, uh, its uh, fiscal uh, position and um, um, how challenging it will be for the authorities to turn that around, and we expect that to weigh on the recovery going forward. Um, that's it from me. And uh, just check and see if there are any questions. I don't see questions on my side. Um, so I'm going to round up here. As you all probably aware, um, my colleague Saji Solanke has um, put together uh, a really great panel um, of speakers that will speak to you about Nigerian uh, fintech in a, a few minutes. And um, uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for joining our 25th anniversary EM and FM conference and listening to our macro update on Sub-Saharan Africa.
Out of context, facts and figures can easily mislead. Is Africa's growing population a weakness? What about tomorrow? Don't get boxed in by today's opinions. With the Africa Report, understand Africa's tomorrow today. Politics, business, opinion, the Africa Report decodes the news for you. Available online on theafricareport.com.